It's another fine day at Camp Dynasty. I am Counselor Austin, joined by Counselor Colin. And it is a very special week because, yes, week seven of college football just happened. But we are not handing out badges for week seven. There, there was points this weekend where I'm watching the games or seeing what was happening in the games. And I was like, oh, man, I can't wait to give him a badge this week. And I was like, wait a minute. No, yeah. because we are doing our mid-season rankings check-in. Yeah, I was, you know, watching Boise State Hawaii. And I'm like, what do you like? I got to figure out a new badge to give Ashton <laughs> Genty that we haven't and like try to figure out a way to talk about. And I was like, oh, wait, no, we don't. We get to talk about him big picture instead of talking about his week against Hawaii, which feels great. So uh, that goes for all these guys up and down the board, though. Yeah. And uh, speaking of that game, by the way, just because this is hilarious, I turned that game on like late Uh, there were there was some shenanigans happening on saturday for a birthday party so you know i'm feeling some kind of way it's like late in the evening i'm like oh boise state's on what's going on in this game so i just quick turn it on like i'm getting ready for bed within 10 seconds was that 50 yard (laughs) touchdown run (laughs) like literally right when i turn it on i'm like all right i'm good shut it off that's what i'm saying (laughs) like that Ashton Genty is the perfect running back for this generation of like consumers because he is the like instant gratification running back where you can just literally turn it turn it on and every time that he's on offense he's going to do something fucking sick. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk about Ashton Genty, but that's probably going to come later in the show because we are doing Top 12s, as we did in the summer, we, when we came out of summer scouting, did our top 12, re-examining that right now. Preface, disclaimer, whatever you want to say, it is the middle of the college football season. So this is not necessarily, hey, I just watched all the tape for all these players And now I totally understand this class better. That's not really what this is. This is more of a, based on how the flow of the season has gone for seven weeks now, based on how things have changed, what does it look like right now? So yes, this is going to change again. And if you're new to Camp Dynasty, you know that, or you don't know, but you're getting told now that we do our rankings 2.0 series after the college football season. That's where we're going to deep dive every position group. We're going to watch all the film from 2024 and really start to critically look at this class right now. This is a lot of, Hey, what did we see in 2023? And now based on what we have seen in 2024, how has the board shifted? So that's kind of where we are with this. And I want to put out there, I ranked Travis Hunter as a receiver. And I did as well. Okay. I think I think that's where we're heading. And so I think that's from now on, let's just He did assume. say that he was going to play both on a podcast. And we'll, we'll see about that. Yeah, we'll find out if that When flies, he's but... making, to, <laughs> you know, tens of millions of dollars, yeah. you fully guaranteed on a rookie deal. If his coach is going to be like, oh, yeah, do whatever you want, Travis. <laughs> whatever, uh, man. I don't, I don't think so. All right. With all that said, starting at number 12, I can go first. Trey Harris, wide receiver, Ole Miss. I've met 11. Okay. So I did go kind of, there was a little bit of like flip-flopping that happened for me towards the end of this the, the last few spots here, there's a couple players that I had to leave out that it, it, it did hurt me to leave them out. There, this is a good class. We've, we've talked a lot about that already. But in the case of Trey Harris, getting him into this final spot of the first round for me, it's just I can't ignore what he's doing right now in this season. I mean, this he is leading college football right now in receiving yards. 
987 yards, six touchdowns coming off of, you know, the week seven, the, the game against LSU, which was very dramatic and LSU, you know, ends up winning that game, but Trey Harris, 102 yards and a touchdown. And he had that ridiculous touchdown catch over on the back of the defender. And that was just so Trey Harris and he's done it, you know, how many times already this year, but really leveling up from what we've seen from him. And and we've been, we've had our eyes pretty firmly on him now for over a year because we thought he would be in the 2024 class. So I'm not looking at this season in which he's like dominating the, in terms of receiving, he's well ahead of number two right now. I'm not looking at it as, Oh, he's put it all together. He's suddenly the, the fastest and, you know, he, he should be the number two wide receiver in this class. That's not really what we're at, where we're at, but I think he's having an impressive enough year where this was a player that was my wide receiver six coming into the year. He's moving up to my wide receiver five right now, and he's becoming a first round dynasty talent at this point in the season. Yeah, I, I think like I've been pretty high on Trey Harris the last two years. I really liked him last year before he decided to go back for his fifth season. Um, And I mean, he looks better than he did last year, this year. Like he looks like a more complete player. He's still dominant at the catch point. Like all the things that you just mentioned, it's like, this is a, a player who looks like a guy that has developed in the off season and throughout this season to become a high powered offenses bona fide number one target and consistently putting together huge box scores and the eye test also passes. So he's going to surpass his career or he already did surpass his career high in yards last week against LSU. And we're going to be, I mean, seeing just more and more of that through the rest of the season. Maybe you run at the Blitnikoff award with what these stats are going to end up looking like for Trey Harris. So yeah, I got him sitting at the 11 spot and this is a non super flex uh, rankings. Just so everybody's like, oh, once we start getting towards the top, if you're wondering why there's maybe a quarterback, maybe not. That's why. Yes. Thank you. This is, we, we are one quarterback here. We are one quarterback plus meaning six point passing touchdown, negative three for an interception, also full IDP. So we hadn't, we, I had an IDP, I think in my top 12 in the summer. Yep. We'll find out if that holds true, but for now, Trey Harris, my number 12, your number 11. So your number 12. My number 12 is Devin Neal running back out of Kansas. Um, It's hasn't been as sexy as of late as it was early in the season, but he's been playing some good football. Uh, He had a hundred plus yards in his first four games, had 70 yards in each of the last two um, has five touchdowns on the season. Hasn't given up the ball at all. Um, And then he also has seven catches for 83 yards, which they'd use him more in the passing game because he looks real good when he's out there. Um, But uh, Neil is one of the most elusive backs in this class. And um, he he looks like a guy that could be one of those uh, pass catching backs that can also get it done on the ground. So somebody that will like go maybe late second, early third round that – backs up a veteran you can scoop up a little you know and see what happens with Devin Neal so uh I'm a big fan uh we'll see we'll see what what happens with Devin Neal with this you know interesting usage that he gets at Kansas yeah I mean this is a another name that's very familiar if you have been listening to Camp Dynasty since last season Devin Neal was your RB one at one point in the process. And it's because he's a really good player. And I think coming into this season, I, I mean, in this very talented running back class, I had him as a top five running back coming into the year. I believe he was my number 12 player overall coming into the season. Number 11, actually coming into the season. Uh, He did not make my top 12 this go around, but that is not, 
by any you know fault of his own necessarily. There are players here that are rising and in some cases rising very significantly up the board that just pushed my last few players out at this point. But I think Devin Neal is a perfect example of how deep and talented this running back class is when you're talking about a guy like this potentially being in the second round of a dynasty rookie draft. And there's no shortage of other running backs you could throw into that conversation as well. Like, oh my God, that guy's going to be a second, third round yeah. type of dynasty rookie running back pick. This is that kind of class. It's it's absolutely loaded. We'll find out who is in and who's out when it's all said and done. But remember, this was a player that could have been in last year, decided to stay in school. So he will be in this class. This is a senior, and I think he's going to be one of the highest backs taken. Yeah, I agree. I hope he goes to a team that throws throws the ball to him. Yeah. I mean, every every time he gets into space, man, it's just I know, it's deadly. So... Yeah, 25 receptions last year. That was a that was a career high. He only has seven on the year so far. So thumbs down. <laughs> All right. Number where am I? Number eleven for me is Ollie Gordon. I've met ten. Okay. Yep. I, I wasn't sure. I we because we we kind of saw him differently just a little bit in the preseason. There was a little bit, you know, we we played it up a little bit, like oh I hate him, whatever. I think this is a natural reaction to what we have seen from him this year, and I this is one of the players that I did actually go back and try to find some film on because I just wanted to make sure that I had a grasp on what exactly is happening at Oklahoma State that is leading the reigning Doak Walker award winner to look just so much different this year. I mean, he's at 3.6 yards per carry right now, only 362 yards on the season in six games. That is, you know, he's coming off of a 1700 yard (laughs) season. So it's pretty jarring. And I mean, from what I watched, the, the offensive line is doing him no favors. I mean, that's pretty clear. I do think that some of the issues that I had with him even coming into the year are really exacerbated when you don't have blockers in front of you. Like the the slower feet are yeah. really showing up when it's like he's got guys in his face pretty quickly and he's just not able to manipulate that, that short amount of space that he has in the way that some of these other guys can. So... I'm not ready to completely, you know, drop him off the face of the planet because he hasn't lived up to his billing coming into the year. I do still think he's a really talented player. One one really encouraging thing about this season is that they've they've kept him very involved in the passing game, which it was a big plus for him. He had 50 targets last year, 39 catches as a 6'2", 225 back that runs with a lot of, you know, power. And they're still getting them involved there how they can. So not not dead yet, but he is he is one of the fallers of the class so far. I mean, this is a huge slide for me. He was a uh, number two ranked for me. Yeah. Drops down to yeah. number ten here, and I wanted to drop him lower, honestly, but I didn't want to. That's uh, I said before. I was like. How much do I want to overreact on this one? And it was mostly because of Ali Gordon and the struggles that he's had early in this season, the lowest yards per carry by far that he's had. And it's a lot due to not being able to, you know, make the first guy miss. But unfortunately, the first guy is in the backfield quite often. So it's like... Yeah, I want to like get him out of here because these stat lines look disgusting. You know, you're looking at 17 carries on 41 yards, 11 carries on 42 yards, 13 carries 50 yards, and you see what other guys in this class are doing, and it's like, uh, yeah, but I'd like you to just, you know, do better. <laughs> like it, it's hard to watch Ali Gordon right now, and so. Uh, a guy that's came into the season with so much hype that you have such high expectations for that was one of the, if not the best running back in the country last year, 
comes into his junior year, going to be draft eligible. You want him to repeat that success, and he has fallen kind of flat so far this year. So, you know, it's going to be one of the harder, like when you're on the clock and that draft button lights up and Ollie Gordon's available late in the first round and there's other guys that are like around this value, I feel like he's going to be one of the harder ones to press that draft button because it's like, yeah, he was really only good for one season though. If this kind of stuff keeps up. Well, and what's interesting too, it's, it's almost scary how much he is on the exact trajectory that rocket Sanders went Mm -hmm. on similar players, similar build, similar skill set. honestly, yeah. Gordon runs with a, a lot more oomph than Rocket did. That was one of the big negatives about Rocket. But it is shocking to see how similar it is in terms of this massive, massive season, just gaudy numbers, to, and then down to nothing. And we mm-hmm. saw Rocket return to school and tra- and ends up at South Carolina I don't know that that's going to happen to Ollie Gordon because I just think he's a more talented player in general where maybe there is still this like wave that he can ride just based off of his talent alone and, and the tape that he put out in 2023. But I do think it's interesting that that conversation might just start, might start happening if this trend that we've seen for the first half of the season doesn't improve. Then yeah. there's going to be conversations of should he return to school or not. So interesting we'll see we'll we'll find out the biggest the last thing i want to I'll leave you with with ollie gordon the biggest shocker when you just look pure numbers last season 31 runs of 15 or more yards the, the quote-unquote breakaway runs yeah. something that he was you know just known for last year at at this size three this season just a complete 180 in terms of being a breakaway big play runner. So it also hasn't scored a touchdown since week two, which is like <laughs> one of the appeals of a guy like Ollie Gordon yeah. is the goal line short yardage stuff and just not not making it work. Yeah, it's been tough. It's been tough. All right. So number ten for you. Because uh, Ollie Gordon was my ten. Was you, okay, so my number 10, here is where I am going out on a bit of a limb because I I don't have a full tape eval backing me up on this. Okay. But I've watched enough of what I can of this player to feel comfortable enough at this point in time to say, I, I want him in this conversation because I think this is where he's going to be when, when it's all said and done. And that's Caleb Johnson, the running back from Iowa. Yeah. I mean, did did he make your cut at all? He's uh, at 13 for me. Okay. So I'm I'm glad that we're on the same page there because I just think what he is doing this season is so impressive. It's being overshadowed by Ashton Genty, of course. But this is like a normal like junior yeah. year breakout year. This is like <laughs> if Ashton Genty didn't exist, I feel like everyone would be like, man, Caleb Johnson is just going wild right now. Yeah. And I thought this week against Washington was maybe the best film he's put out this season so far. I thought he looked more decisive, quicker His his feet were a little quicker. Just everything was sort of in harmony this week where he, there was no, hesitation you saw that a little bit earlier in the season specifically thinking about Iowa State where he looked a little bit hesitant behind the line of scrimmage and there was there's kind of this question of like yeah he's looking good but I'd like to see the game speed up for him a little bit and I think that's what you saw this last week so that makes me excited to really get into the to the meat of this season and see how he's progressed over the course of the year it seems to me like he's gaining confidence that that he's really starting to come into his own now halfway through this season. And it's been a phenomenal season in terms of production with 932 yards rushing, 12 touchdowns on the year, has not fumbled the ball, 
He's not really like super involved as a pass catcher, but you've seen it a few times this year where he looks pretty comfortable when they get him out and, and get him running some routes. And you, you saw it in this game too, this, this last week, just getting him kind of just getting him out of the backfield on a quick little out play. And they, he scores on that play. He does look like a natural pass catcher as well. So I don't think that's something that's necessarily a negative part of his eval. So I think overall, he's just a really complete running back that's breaking out in a big way this year. Yeah, Caleb Johnson is a pleasant running back to watch. Like He fuels this Iowa offense to points that they haven't reached in my memory of watching college football. Like It's always been a, a defense and like grinded out team, but when you're handing the ball to Caleb Johnson to grind these games out, he is slashing through teams and he's getting big gains. And he, he's just like the like quintessential running back. Like when, when you're looking at this guy, he's a, he's a clean pure runner that, you know, finds a hole. Like you said, uh, it, it can be a little iffy, but uh, you can tell he's reading his offensive line and like, as the season has progressed, he's become quicker at finding what's available to him because he really is a, a one cut guy and go and then like break some tackles along the way. He's not doing, you know, a whole lot after that, but he definitely showed off some nice hands catching in this game against Washington that you were talking about. He like, it wasn't, the the alligator arm, you know, catch it with your chest. He was going out and he was snagging it with his hands and transferring to a runner pretty smoothly. So uh, I was impressed with that. And it's, you know, not the most impressive, like, routes or anything, but they're not asking him to do that. So why would he? Um, but, yeah, I, I think he he's a very smart runner. I think he's a very efficient runner. And uh, like you said, if Genty wasn't around, I think he'd be – a little more popular of a name. Yeah. I, and, and six foot two twenty five. part of that, like appeal of like, man, he just looks like the quote unquote, like prototype he's running, running back. back. Yeah. He's a running Proto back. He's the prototype <laughs> running back. Six foot two twenty five. runs with speed, runs with power. Yep. I mean, his yards after contact per attempt number is a very healthy 5.64 number right now. That exactly. is the first thing I noticed when you, when you watched him earlier in the year, it was like, man, he runs with a lot of power. The leg drive is so impressive. Just able to move tacklers forward and pick up those tough extra yards. But the elusiveness has just really come out here. And over the last few weeks, you're seeing him really come into his own in terms of a complete runner that can win in a variety of ways. So Damn right. really excited to continue to watch Caleb Johnson. But for now, who is your number nine player? Here's a quarterback. Oh, my God. Show. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh. It's the, the only quarterback that can make it in this kind of format, and it's Jalen Milrow. Um, so Milrow, we talked about a lot after the Week 5 matchup with Georgia, the kind of heavyweight bout that uh, they had. And he put on, you know, pretty much a master class performance. He had the one pick, but outside of that, like 374 yards, two touchdowns. And then he also had, you know, four scrambles and put together some decent rushing numbers. And he's been good on the ground all season, as we would expect. He had 113 yards in that Georgia game, uh, two touchdowns on the ground. And he's up to almost 400 yards rushing this season. Um, that's more than Ali Gordon, who we just talked about as a former Doak Award winner. Um, so... Milrow, to me, uh, I was very skeptical and am still a little bit of a skeptic on Milrow, but he looks better. Um, he's in a more, he's in a friendlier offensive scheme. Uh, that's obvious. And Ryan Williams doesn't hurt a whole lot to have that guy catching passes from you. But yeah, I, he 
is three weeks in a row has thrown at least one interception. Would like to see that get cleaned up. He was very clean and poised through his first four games of the season. Um, seems to be, don't want that to become a trend to, to turn the ball over. Um, but it's a, the dual threat quarterback. And I think like when you come down to it, he's going to be selected highly by a team and he's going to start for at least like three, four years. And if he's any good, like we just had this happen with Jaden Daniels last year, where we were skeptical on a guy because of the small stuff around the margins and he cleans it up his senior year. And it's like, yeah, but is this the real player or is the player we've been seeing this whole time, the real player and Jaden Daniels looks damn good in the NFL. And so, you know, you match Jalen Milrow up in a decent landing spot with a good OC and, you know, he's going to produce decent numbers. So I think that's the the big and the small of it. Yeah, I don't – Milrow doesn't make my top 12 just because I'm still a little leery of the quarterback class overall. But I said, you know, a few weeks ago, like – Jalen Milrow is my QB one at this point, and and he still is. I know that the last few weeks, couple weeks, have have been a little strange with the loss to Vanderbilt, and then the South Carolina game. Definitely not his best stuff in that in, in this week's game. So the highest highs, not quite the lowest lows, because we we I think we're past that. I think we're past like this is maybe not even a real quarterback. Like, (laughs) like we were saying last year when he got benched, but I think it's all part of the experience for him. I think he's obviously still growing as a passer and there's going to be these, you know, obstacles bumps in the road that happen for him. But I think it, it, everything that you were able to say about him coming out of the Georgia game still applies today. We're not just going to say, Oh, there's been two weeks. Oh, okay. Throw him back down the list, whatever. You you saw flashes from him in that game. You saw flashes from him earlier in the season against Wisconsin and in some of the earlier games as well against some of the weaker teams. You've seen that this is clearly a player that is developing. He's not done developing. He's still figuring things out, but what you he's love is... He's 21 this, years old. Right. <laughs> Wait, you're telling me he's not a finished product yeah, yet? Yeah, right. But... He's obviously still growing, but I think what you've seen this year is a lot of growth from 2023 and that's everything you need to see, especially in a quarterback class like this, where this is going to be your highest, you know, upside player. And especially in terms of fantasy and dynasty, you're looking at a guy like this on top of your quarterback rankings pretty easily at this point. Took Jaden Daniels. So he's 24 years old. So, right. See, never know. And it, and it works out. It wasn't just that he was 24. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it turns Somehow. out he's actually gotten a lot better. Somehow, because I'm looking at my spreadsheet from last year, big red mark on it right there. Because <laughs> of his age. <laughs> hey, man, Xavier League, who had a touchdown again. Age. That, there's, they're saying age doesn't matter anymore. Well, For, at first, it did matter a lot, and now it doesn't matter anymore. So, some may say. <laughs> All right. Well, my number nine player is the same player that was my number nine in the summer. And it's Isaiah Bond. Do you have him higher? I don't. He did not make your top 12 then. He's not in my first round. Which is totally fair. Which is totally fair. Because I think one thing that I was hoping to see from Bond this year in the Texas offense was to take his game kind of to the next level. Like, I think it was pretty reasonable to assume that in this offense with, you know, what Quinny Ors, who is is now back but did miss some time, I think it was pretty reasonable to think he could really grab hold of this and, and become the best version of himself. And I don't think that's really what we've seen through one half of a season. I don't think he's really grabbed the bull by the horns, you know, pun intended. But... Uh, I'm still betting on the athleticism and the traits that he has in terms of just pure speed. I think it's pretty rare. And so it's hard for me to just say, especially in a wide receiver group like this, 
that what we've seen from him on the field this season is enough to really drop him down the board at this point. But I will say, I think, I, and I think I did say this before the season, this would have been my prime candidate to really climb the board this year, maybe even become like a top five, top four type dynasty rookie in this class. And that's not what we've seen at all. So he sits here still at number nine for me. Yeah, Bond, I like as a player a lot, but there had to be room for guys to move up. And it just kind of came at the expense of Isaiah Bond moving down because Bond has been like solid, but it's been in a deep threat fashion, which you expect out of a guy like this. But I would have loved to see a more like, every down role for bond rather than being a field stretcher that's getting targeted, you know, three to five times a game with, you know, a couple, you know, a seven target game and a six target game. But, you know, either way, it's like, I, I would have loved to see him be like a featured part of this offense where he's getting, you know, 10 targets in a game every once in a while, you know, where he's getting kind of peppered, running some short and intermediate routes and getting the ball in space, running after the catch a little bit. But I don't know. I, I just I haven't loved the usage and I don't know if that's should be an indictment on the player or if that's more of a scheme issue or you know maybe a little bit of both so i like isaiah bond um i just like him a little more towards the top of the second round than i do in the first round and also just want to point it out because it did happen this weekend he did get hurt in the oklahoma game so you see the stats here one catch yeah. five yards he did leave this game and i have not heard anything about the severity or the status of that injury. So yeah, I love college football, right? <laughs> it's like just <laughs> classic. Like I can't tell what, what, what it means, but so he he's optimistic. Get hurt, but, yeah. Steve okay, well, Sarkeesian there. is optimistic about getting him back for the Georgia game. We'll, we'll take that. That's about as day good to as it day gets with an ankle injury. All right. All right. Well, that hey, day to day. That's like pretty descriptive. One Google. I feel <laughs> like, uh, come on. <laughs> I read like two articles and, and everything was like, we're waiting static, whatever, whatever. I'm just a bad, bad journalist. I get it. Um, Who's your number eight? My number eight. Who was your yeah. number eight? Uh, we haven't done my number eight yet because you just did your number nine after I did my number nine. Right. And then That's I talked about Isaiah Bond. Word. So unless you, if you want me to do my number eight, I no, will. No, I got it. I'll go. Okay, all right. I'll go. Number eight, uh, Travion Henderson. Okay, I have Meyer. We could probably wait. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ooh. Ooh. Yeah. ooh. <laughs> all right. Well, then I who's have, your number eight? <laughs> I, here we are. Uh, I have a Mecca Egbuka here at number eight. I have my number seven. Okay. Um, so Egbuka is doing what we asked Egbuka to do, which is phenomenal because I was a little worried early in the season when Jeremiah Smith had the spotlight, especially in week one against Akron, when it was like, oh no, Egbuka only had four catches for 51 yards. Is this just like his whole life now where he's just re relegated to, you know, this ultra talented wide receiver one on his team. And he's just like the second slot guy that's just like vacuuming up the short yard and stuff uh but then he's been nothing but great ever since then um he's had at least 90 yards in four of five games since then um with 117 yards against marshall uh he had you know, 10 catches on 10 targets for 93 yards and a touchdown against oregon huge game um won't expand further on that game outside of what Igbuka did. Uh, but yeah, it was, it's been a, a solid season where his, after his sophomore year, it was very much like a lot of excitement around Igbuka how, of where he'd end up in the 2024 class. Um, he ends up having an injury riddled junior year and, you know, is, behind Marvin Harrison Jr., bad quarterback on that team, 
who looks quite good at Syracuse right now, but he was really bad in that Ohio State. I won't see the revisionist history. Um, and then in 2024, you're like, hopefully he can bounce back and become who he was that sophomore year, and he's doing just that. So uh, Ibuka has scored in his last four games. It looks like the real deal. Looks like a solid, again, high floor with a high ceiling. I think they're both the case here but i think he's one of the highest floor guys in the class yeah he's back he's he's so back and it's it's just awesome to see it because you know you you have all the confidence in the world that he can be this player again after whatever happened last year with the injuries and clearly not being himself last season but there's always that voice in the back of your head that's like man i just i really hope we're we didn't lose something here with Igbuka and now you're seeing nope nope everything is is totally fine he's the same player that he was in 2022 when he was a very highly touted prospect for us here at Camp Dynasty and that's what he's going to be this year and he, he comes in at number seven uh on on my list because there's a lot of really talented players ahead of him in this class but I think this is really kind of the range here. I think it starts at eight for me with Henderson. And obviously we'll talk about Henderson later. You have him even higher than that. I think that's really kind of where the tier starts for me at this point is like now we're accelerating into some really, really talented guys. I think Egbuka is a first round caliber NFL wide receiver. And so, you know, whatever you want to say about his role as a slot receiver or his role as a, you know, quote unquote, number two receiver. I don't care about any of that. I think he's going to be a phenomenal NFL wide receiver and one that is going to be very fantasy relevant, no matter what role he has. Hey, teams run through wide receiver sets almost all the time now. He'll play if he's in the slot. Sorry. That's <laughs> not a thing I care about. Yeah. <laughs> also, <laughs> he can play outside. Yeah. We had this conversation probably two years ago when we did this, but yeah. like he's not, he is not the kind of slot receiver that I feel like can only play out of the slot. I they agree. primarily play him out of the slot at Ohio State because there's always guys on the outside that are playing in front of him. And yep. he just also happens to be an amazing slot wide receiver, but I don't think he's limited to that. So I, I agree. All right. So number seven for you, seven for me was Egbuka. Right. Seven for me is Omarion Hampton. Hell yeah. Running back out of North Carolina. Um, this is one of your guys. Do you have much higher than this? I have him at number four. Okay. So. All right. Well, you want to get him out of the way here? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Hampton is kind of similar to Caleb Johnson, but I feel like he's like the kind of new and improved version of Caleb Johnson where, you know, you turn up the stats a little bit on NCAA, you like add plus two to everything and you end up getting this guy where he's like, he's a hit in the hole decisively. He's a strong runner and he's got, you know, burner speed after he gets like past the second level. So uh, a complete back that, I have comp to Jonathan Taylor based on running style. I think I will continue to do that because I continue to see that. I don't think he's as good as Jonathan Taylor before the people come for me, but I think the way he runs aesthetically reminds me of Jonathan Taylor. I like that comp. That's nice. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, <laughs> Omari and the Hampton. Soak it in for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Marion Hampton was my RB1 uh, in the preseason. He is not my RB1 anymore. He is my RB2, so he is holding that spot. Um, everything you said, I mean, I think just a really complete running back that hasn't done anything like this season to make me think that what I saw from 2023 was an anomaly. I think... a. Maybe not a similar player, but like kind of a similar vibe to like Trey Benson last year, where it was like he comes in as my RB1 
And then the numbers through half a season, it was like, well, what's going on? Like, what is the deal here? Is there regression? Is it the offense? What is in Hampton's case, there's been no regression. He has been one of the best and most productive running backs in college football this season, 934 yards, seven touchdowns this year. He's also getting involved in the passing game again this year. That was something that last year was, you know, it wasn't a huge part of his game, but he did have 29 receptions for 222 yards. So they were getting him worked in there. He's got 20 catches already this season for 135 yards. But again, you're seeing that blend of power and elusiveness, kind of like what you said, we talked about with Caleb Johnson. And in this case, Hampton, uh, the yards after contact per attempt number is still over four. It's a little bit down from last year, but still over four. So that looks pretty good. And then the missed tackles for sitting at 45 right now, he had 67 last year. So he's on pace to probably exceed that again or exceed that this year. So statistically, it's been a great season for him. I'm excited to see how the tape looks. One of the biggest questions that I had with him, even as my number one running back coming into the season was the vision. And that's a pretty big question to have. You can have all the physical tools in the world, but if you cannot see the field, well, then Don't that's going to, it's going to limit you quite a bit. I'm excited to see if, if it looks like there's been improvement from him in that area this season, but Again, 1,500 yards last year and probably going to get up there again this year. Not too bad. Damn right. All right. So we are at number six. My number six. Because your seven was Egbuka, correct? Correct. Okay. So my number six is Luther Burden. Okay. I have Burden at four. Okay. So this is another one that I think would probably qualify as one of my bigger falls from the summer, Ollie Gordon being the the biggest fall, but Burden was my number two overall player coming into the year, and he is at number six. And and again, it's it's a similar conversation to Gordon, just at a much lesser degree, where I had questions about the player coming into the season. And there's always a little bit of projection when you're talking summer rankings, because you're you're hoping that some of the issues you saw or, or you know, assuming that a player is going to grow in a few critical areas the upcoming season. And in, in Burden's case, I just don't think I've seen the growth that I was hoping to see. He, he certainly was not my number two overall player in terms of pure 2023 film. That was very much projection based. Like, man, at times he looked like a complete difference making game changing type of talent that I could totally see taking this next step and going on the Malik neighbors sort of arc. We've talked about that a lot, similar players, similar ways that they win. And I said this when we called home about burden, he just hasn't taken those steps. And I don't think he's going to get there. He's just not Malik neighbors. He's not going to be that sort of, you know, plug and play day one superstar caliber receiver that I think a lot of us thought he could be coming out of last season. So Still a very talented player. He's having a little bit of a down year, but I'm not super concerned about the the production dipping a little bit. I just think he is what he is, and it's a it's a playmaker. It's a great player, but it's not a transcendent wide receiver talent. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think he's a little more of the second half of 2023 luther burden than the first half like and that's okay because he's still a good player in the second half he just wasn't like on pace to break all the records kind of player so uh burden like he still looks fantastic with the ball in his hands he still looks like uh, a player like worthy of you know eight ten targets a game it's just like is the ceiling as high as we thought it was when He's not like the only focal point of the offense. And it turns out that he isn't. And so while the like the the per touch stats look similar 
it's just like when the volume is turned down, it's less inspiring and like the yards per reception have gone down like a yard per reception. It's like, yeah, is that a big deal? No. Um, He's playing more in the slot by a little bit, which I like. I think that's a good idea. Um, But the yards per route run has gone down significantly because he's not getting the looks uh, in bunches like he was last year. So um, I, I like burden a lot. Uh, he's still my number four player. He's still, um, number two, my number two wide receiver. Like we'll see if he can maybe do a, a little like freaky Friday of last season where the back half of the year is really impressive. And then, you know, he'll skyrocket up the draft board. But, uh, as of now, got him at number four and you got him at number six. So, my number six is Burden. Your number six was Travis Hunter. Oh, is Travis Hunter? All right. right. Uh, so Travis Hunter, um, the wide receiver, is a very good player. Um, coming off his worst week in terms of production against Kansas State, but started the season with four straight hundred yard games and then eighty nine yards against UCF. Uh, has six touchdowns on the season. It's just wildly impressive what Travis Hunter is doing in college football right now. Um, Like the Heisman race this year is kind of insane with him and Genty and, you know, anybody else that you want to throw in because it's normally a quarterback award. Um, But given that he's playing both sides of the ball and still putting up, you know, elite wide receiver numbers and, has shown improvement as a wide receiver when it comes to route running and nuance and uh, his hands in general look a little better. So uh, he, he's the focal point of this team in general and especially this passing game. Uh, and I don't see any of this production going away anytime soon. Why do I have him as a wide receiver? Uh, why do I think he's going to get drafted as a wide receiver? Because they make the most money and get injured less frequently and have longer primes. Like I just think it adds up. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's literally as simple as follow the money. I mean, he's he's showing you that he's a talented wide receiver. Where even if he isn't necessarily like there today in terms of development, which is a thing, I think is is fair to say he needs to continue to develop as a wide receiver, but. I have him as my number three player right now because I just think he's such a rare athlete. And obviously what you've seen from him for the last year and a half as a wide receiver has been impressive. And it would be impressive on its own, but it just so happens that he's playing as a full-time cornerback on top of it. So it's like, to me, when you see what he's doing this year, which is obviously, you know, improving as a wide receiver, I think that's pretty fair to say it's, it's showing up in the stat sheet. I think it's showing up on film as well from what I've seen, but I think you're seeing a player that's improving as a wide receiver, even when he's not even giving the position his full attention, he's, he's 50, 50 right now, and he's playing both sides at a high level. So my mind is is going to go to what can Travis Hunter become if he just is a full-time wide receiver? Like if 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 he gets drafted as a wide receiver and that is his full it, it gives it his full attention and he's not playing <laughs> like 40 to 50 other snaps on any given game and he's not ga- like gassing yep. himself on the other side of the ball, what can he look like? And I think what we've seen from him this year, especially as a wide receiver is encouraging and exciting enough for me to say, yeah, I'm going to put him at the top or near the top of this draft class. He's my wide receiver two at this point, because I'm just enamored with what he can be when this is his full-time job. Yeah, that's a great point. Like it's unbelievable how good he is at both positions and like, 
if he were to only focus on being a receiver and, you know, hone his craft completely, I think the sky's the limit. So Travis Hunter, number three for me and yep. number five for you. So I, my number five. The Travis Hunter is my number six. Number six. Yes. Okay. Do I know your number five? Not yet. Why don't you take it away then? It's Trey John Henderson. Oh, I see That's what right. you did there. Yeah. Uh, so Travion has been an impressive player. I mean, we have been talking about him for a while here at Camp Dynasty. Uh, if you were around last year, we were talking about him basically all season. And then this year, he's just been like the same player on a lower snap count because Quinshawn Judkins comes into the fold. And so he has to, you know, take a step back in his role. And I think that's kind of served him well because it's a player that has had some injury issues and he's had, you know, maybe you don't want him to be a workhorse back in his senior year of his college season. Maybe you just need him to be the, the punchy efficient player that he is that can catch passes and pass block. Um, and he's been, he's had his, his best season of his career in terms of yards per attempt. He's averaging almost eight yards per carry. Um, he has four, 418 yards on the season. He has four touchdowns. Um, he's forced 15 missed tackles, which is already half of the number that he forced last year. Um, and the best that he's done on pace since his freshman season, uh, which was his like basically a freshman breakout season. And it was like, this is the guy. And then it's like, you know, we've been back and forth and now we're back. You know, I, I feel pretty good about Travion, uh, despite the suppressed box scores because he has to share a backfield with another very talented runner. Yeah. I mean, he was, he probably would have been RB one last year if yeah. he had come out. And I don't really know. We've talked about it a lot. We don't know what entirely went into the decision to return, but it's good to see that through half of a season, not only has Travion not really lost anything, but it, it seems like he might even be kind of becoming the best version of himself here. And and I, I do think it has a lot to do with the fact that he is not getting the full share of the carries. I think it, what we've learned about Henderson here maybe is that he does work better in this sort of committee backfield, but that's the direction that the NFL has gone anyway. I mean, that is just the nature of the game at this point. So I'm not going to look at it and say, well, I, I'm not, I don't really want to draft that player, you know, with a mid first round pick. It's like, no, this is just a really talented running back. And I think, you know, he, he was my RB four before the season. He's still my RB four today, but like I said, I think this kind of starts a tier for me where he is my number eight player, but we're going a tier up from number nine at this point. And that's just because I think he is a really, really good running back. Yeah. And you're number five. And my number five. Well, how about Quinshawn Judkins then? Here we go. I have him at three. So, I mean, again, Nothing has really changed with Judkins. He was my number four player coming into the season. I believe he was number, your number one player coming into the year. That would be correct. So, I mean, obviously we've we've known this name for a long time. You go back to the first year of Camp Dynasty. This was the first freshman breakout yeah, that's that right. we experienced here at Camp Dynasty. And now we're here. And I think if you were to just like drop somebody in front of a computer screen and, and show them his numbers, they might look at the season and be like, whoa, isn't he getting worse? Like, what's happening here? But we just talked about Travion Henderson. That is in incredibly important context here because they are splitting carries. They're both running at a very high clip. Uh, Quinshawn has... 491 yards and Travion has 418. So you put those together, you have one of the top 
you know, producing, producing running backs in college football. So I think they're managing the load for these two guys. They know that they have two extremely talented NFL caliber running backs. So I think everything we've seen from Quinshawn this season is kind of, you know, maybe not what we would have expected necessarily. I don't think it's been quite to that level, but I don't think it's been anything super negative. And, and he's definitely sticking here at the top of this class. Yeah, there's a little bit of up and down with Judkins when you watch Ohio State. There's a li- he, he seems like he's getting caught up in the backfield a little more than you would like him to. Um, but then there's the good that happens that is like, okay, yeah, but he's also putting together those you know chunk plays that can kind of change an offense's uh, – it can flip the field for an offense, frankly. Like he, he can – do it just as good as he ever could. And so it's like, while he's getting the less touches and like he knew he was coming into a situation where he's going to be getting less touches, he's still like getting seven yards per carry and still has 500 yards at mid season and six touchdowns. And, um, coming off uh, another guy that's coming off his worst game against Oregon here, um, 2.3 yards per carry. And that one was pretty ugly. If you, if you watched it, it was like, man, I just want to see Judkins like get get something going here. And it seemed like Henderson was, you know, doing a little less, which ended up, you know, being better because it was like not trying so hard to break a big one. And is so I guess that's the, the give and take with the two Ohio State running backs is seems like Henderson is a little more like the vet, quote unquote, where like, He'll put his nose down and get you a couple yards and do whatever. And Judkins still has that like big play hunter kind of vibe to him, which, you know, gives him the uh, eight 15 plus yard runs on the season. Um, But it also can lend itself to when you play, you know, the best team of the season so far and you put together 2.3 yards per carry, it's like, I'd love to see it. And, you know, if that was one of your big days, that would have been great. Yeah, I'm really hoping that over the last half of the season, we get to see some big Quinshawn games in the Big Ten schedule. Yes. I think that will be a, a lot. It will go a long way to put any sort of like creeping thoughts of doubt that have emerged, uh, put those to rest. Because I think... You know, we came into the year thinking this is potentially a special kind of running back talent, and I still believe that that can be true. Uh, it's just that you'd love to see it materializing on the field a little bit more. But again, we knew it, you said it. He knew what he signed up for when he came here. Both of these backs kind of understand what is <laughs> what's going on here, so it's not going to look as perfect as. And Omari and Hampton, who's getting 30 carries every game, it seems like. So. Exactly. All right. I think that leaves two players. Yeah. Well, no, I have three left. You do have three left. Oh, wait. You, who was your number four? Omari and Hampton. Okay. Never mind. I just missed one. Yes, we have two players left. And... Um, I think we're going to have the same players in the same order if everything goes right here. I think so. You know, there was a part of me. There was a part of me that almost did not do this. (laughs) But. You kind of have to, right? It feels like you have to. And we'll talk about it. It's well well earned. But let's start with number two, Tyrell McMillan. Yep. So. I want to I want to make this very clear. Ashton Genty has stolen the show. Yes. But Tedaro McMillan, who was my number one player overall coming into the season, is still a phenomenal player. And I think when you talk about the top of this dynasty class, I think this this point that I'm about to make can change over time, and I'm maybe I'm sure it will. But I think right now, today, I think there are two players that I'm like, damn, I want one of those two picks. 
Like yeah. I want one of those two players and Tedero McMillan is the other one because he has been everything you've wanted him to be this season. I know there's been some questions because he's kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit in terms of the production. Obviously we had the huge week one, the 300 yard game. And it was like, man, this is going to be, this is going to be a special season, isn't it? Yep. And it it hasn't been quite that. He hasn't had 300 yards every week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, the most he's had since then was in week six with 158 against Texas Tech. But I still think what we've seen from him this year can lead you to believe that this is kind of undoubtedly the best wide receiver in this class. And I think potentially a special kind of wide receiver, the sort of wide receiver that can be a top 10 draft pick in the NFL. So we'll continue to obviously see what happens over the the second half of the season, see if he can really finish strong. But in my opinion, he's, he's lost almost nothing in terms of, you know, if you look at this, if, if you look at the statue and you're like, Oh, what's going on? 11 yards, 50 yards, whatever, 78 yards this week. I think this Arizona offense has taken a pretty significant step backwards. And I think that has a lot to do with why he's not quite dominating on a week to week basis, but he's still on pace. He's still on pace to have as many, maybe even more receiving yards. yards. Yeah. than as he did last year. So yeah, he's been really good this season. I, I think the, you know, a couple games where he hasn't looked great has to do as much with game plan and quarterback play as it has with himself. Um, I, I think, like, he's been great. And he's the same player that we talked about week one. Uh, it's just, like, everything was firing on all cylinders in week one where he was open a lot. He was making contested catches and he was getting peppered with targets. And so it's like all of that plus some yak equals the best game of your career. And now it's like on and off, you know, every other week, whatever. But I still think that when you have a player that has this type of athletic gift where he's 6'5", 212, smooth as silk, can go up and get it, has great hands and can run after the catch, it's like – yeah, I'm going to take this guy number two overall every time. One thing I want to point out, too, is we 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 know of him as being a contested catch god because of his frame and his hands. And I think this year you've seen that number dip a little bit. Right now he's sitting at 6 of 14, which is... Not terrible, but for a player like this, Mm -hmm. you'd expect him to come down with a few more of those. But where he's taken a bit of a step back in terms of the contested stuff, he has taken that step forward as a yards after the catch player. Right now, Tedero McMillan leads all pass catchers in missed tackles forced right now. Tedero McMillan. The 6'5", 212 catch point monster is currently leading receivers in missed tackles forced as 306 yards after the catch this season. He has grown in that area, and I don't have any questions about the contested stuff. I don't care what the numbers are telling you this year. There's a lot of like situational luck that can go into those plays once in a while. I think right now that number's fine, and he's taken a huge step forward in another area of his game. It only solidifies the sort of eval that you're getting with this kind of a player. Yeah, he's sixth in the nation in yards after the catch. Like, that's pretty good. Not bad for a guy who looks like <laughs> like a freaking behemoth out there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do the damn thing, huh? Let's do it. Talked about him every week. Might as well do it again, huh? (laughs) For the first time (laughs) in Camp Dynasty history, we've done this three years now, for the first time ever, 101 has changed 
from the preseason. That's right. Bijan to Marv to now not only just changed, but a player that did not make either of our top fives in, when we did running backs in the summer. That player has now climbed all the way up unanimously, number one overall, Ashton Genty. What is there to really say about Ashton Genty that like hasn't already be, been said? Where I don't know if it's just my algorithm, which it very well might be, but like it seems like Genty has become a household name where if you are talking about college football, his name is going to come up. And it's just because like every single week is ridiculous. Like he has 1,248 rushing yards and 17 touchdowns. That's a full season's worth of, of statistics to compile. And he has that after six games. Like this is an unreasonably good player that consistently puts on a show. Like I said it before, I'll say it again. Like Boise state is must watch TV because of Ashton Genty. And he does like everything well. I, I saw a pass blocking cut up of Genty today. And I'm like, Hey, <laughs> okay. I guess like, I don't even care if he's going to pass blocking because of how good he is at everything else. And like, if you're going to pass block on top of that, like, are you, were you crafted by the hands of God? I don't know, but it seems like it based on the fact that he's going to break every rushing record. If he stays on pace. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time we're getting to really talk about him as a player outside of just, well, another 200-yard oh, yeah, yeah. week, another badge. Like, and and I've explained a little bit of, you know, how I ended up not having him as a top five back in the class coming into the season, having to do with the level of competition and sort of the things that you were seeing on film last year being a little bit cheek, it, it seemed a little cheeky. Like, how how is this going to play against better teams? And what I've learned from watching Genty this season is that I really just think, like, yes, he doesn't have this, like, Bijan, Saquon type of, like, crazy bend and, like, that sort of archetype of the running back position. But what he has is special feet. Mm -hmm. His feet are so fast and so precise that it that's a big reason why he is able to break these huge runs, it seems like, week in and week out. There is almost no delay with Genty when you, when you talk about a player that is receiving the ball on, the, on a handoff diagnosing the play and then choosing the lane and going, there is almost no delay with Genty. It is so fluid. He, he diagnoses so quickly and his feet are so electric that he is just playing at a different speed than most other running backs are able to even dream of playing at. And then you couple that with this contact balance that he has with this really unique frame where he's 5'9", which would be considered undersized for a running back, but he's carrying 215 pounds. It's almost like this really unique blend of like he's so short that he's almost disappearing yeah. behind the line of scrimmage. And you saw, you saw that in the Oregon game where it, it's a like goal-to-go situation and he is flowing behind the line and you watch the linebacker flowing with the blocking, but he just gets lost back there. And then he makes that cut so fast and bounces it outside that the linebacker has no time to adjust. And he scores like a four yard touchdown run, bouncing it outside because the linebacker was making the right read, but he just can't find him, And he's right. too quick to get to that spot. So 
I think it's the little things like that where initially when you watch him, it's like, man, I'm not seeing like this crazy athlete. I'm not seeing any of this. But when you really dial in, it's like, oh, man, yeah, there's a lot going on here that is equaling a running back that is just able to win so easily at this position. And and he he makes the game look so easy. Yeah, it's weird to watch because, like you said, you're not seeing this guy that looks athletically gifted. But, like, obviously he is. And, like, he is, like a much better athlete than everybody else on the field. But it's just because he's like skipping and like sliding through tacklers and sifting through traffic at the line of scrimmage. And then he just like finds the crease or finds the corner or finds the edge and goes and he's just gone. And it's like, man, how are you like so sound fundamentally with your feet and your eyes and then you're also faster than everybody when it comes to, you know, getting in a foot race to the end zone. And I think that's what really makes him special is the blend of the eyes and the feet being so in sync and then being able to transfer that from a almost like standstill skipping position to I found my spot. I'm going. And then you're just like breaking angles from any safety and scoring touchdowns. I mean, 17 of them to be exact. Yeah. Then that, that is the thing too. Like he might not be Bijan and he might not be Saquon, but he is, he is athletic man. Yeah. The, the one cut is so gnarly sometimes. And the speed you said it, he finishes these runs and it's because he's fast. He is. So he he feels like a complete running back to me. I mean, yep. the pass catching has not been there this year. We've talked about this a lot. This was his most productive game as a pass catcher in week seven. It was only three catches for 20 yards. But last year, 44 catches, 578 yards. I mean, he was the best receiving back in college football last season. Purely, undeniably so. And just because we haven't seen it much this year doesn't mean that it's not true anymore. So he's coming into the, he's coming into the NFL as a, you know, a fantasy warhead. Like Mm -hmm. he's going to come in and be that sort of player. And that's how he ends up here at number one. Yep. I agree. Ash and Genty, man, what a player. I just love that we get a year like this where it's, there was some surprises after all. Yeah, we didn't just have to go through the motions of like, well, that was always kind of the appeal of this class. It was like not just like a foregone conclusion who's going where. I feel like there was like we had all the guys in a similar range, but there's a lot of room for interpretation. Yep. Yep, for sure. And we've seen it. I mean, even midseason, how much movement there's been on the board already. That's not entirely typical of what we've done the last couple of years here. It is that sort of class, and we're still learning a lot about it. Like I've said many times, there's a lot of running backs in this class, and I don't think that order or that group is done shifting uh, from now until the end of this season. So it's going to be an exciting year. Obviously, the second half of the season can tell a lot of the tale of these players and their stories, but in the meantime... Any other players that you want to shout out here? Um, two that I have that were on the fringe were Kyle Monengai and Tez Johnson. Monengai, the running back from Rutgers. Tez Johnson, the receiver from Oregon. Yep. And I'll throw in just generally the tight end class. Mm-hmm. This is This is a really good tight end class. Yeah, I do like this tight end class. Like Colson Loveland is my 13th player right now. He is my first guy out. He is still my tight end one right now. Oh. So I know I got, I felt some things about Harold Fannin and I'm still feeling those things, but I'm, I'm listening to my preseason eval right now about Loveland. Our social department put out a TikTok about Harold Fannin. thought that was the nail in the coffin. (laughs) That's just it though. That's how, you know, when you have players like Loveland, like Fannin, like Tyler Warren, 
who has his breakout moment this in week seven, over 200 yards, which just quick aside, Tyler Warren, man, what a player. College football 25, shout out. <laughs> Got the online dynasty rolling with Penn State. I'm just feeding 44 over and over again <laughs> in my first season. It was a bad year. Aller didn't play well. 44 <laughs> played well. And now we're seeing him play well in real life. So that's kind of fun. Yeah, that is kind of fun. But Warren. I, I thought he was younger for some reason. Yeah, senior. But he is going to make a push, I think, as well. I think there's a few guys that can make a push for the top tight end in a really talented class this year. Warren has the frame, the the kind of prototypical 6'6", 255 type of a build. Loveland, we know, is a little bit thinner, and then Fannin is smaller yet. Um, but there's even more tight ends after those. I mean, guys that we talked about that we liked before the season, like Mitchell Evans, Luke Lachey. I mean, th- there's a lot of names in the tight end group. So I know I know it's kind of fallen out of favor in fantasy, but like this is this is another really good class. Harold Fannin from Canton, Ohio, the birthplace of oh. football. <laughs> Come on. All right. <laughs> From All right. the Hall of Fame, got to return to the Hall of Fame. Tyler Warren from Mechanicsville, Virginia. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like just pumping out like mechanics left and right. <laughs> Tyler Warren's like, no, I need to choose my own path, Dad. Yeah. I'm six six two sixty. I need to go play football. <laughs> there's a there's a movie there. Oh yeah. <laughs> um the only I guess I'll shout out on another running back because we haven't done enough of those apparently. Like Manun guy a lot. I've learned that. It is oh, Manun that's right. guy. That's right. I, I heard like that him. on the broadcast, and I was like, I don't think I'm going to yeah. say that. Uh, it doesn't feel <laughs> right, but I'm going to try to do it anyway. It feels too segmented. Like, my yeah. guy flows, my right. guy just, like, right. feels broken up. Like, yeah, change your know. name, man. It what sounds you like you're sounding it out instead of just saying yeah. it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> my nun guy. Anyway. So I like my nun guy a lot as well. But a couple other running backs that I, I really do like in this class. DJ Giddens, who I did shout out in the preseason, he is having a, an excellent season as well. So excited to dive into his tape after this year and see what kind of improvements he's made. And then the other name is Jonah Coleman at Washington, the running back. A little bit of that sort of bowling ball type of a build, but player that's gotten really involved in the passing game now for two years first at Arizona last year now at Washington still getting involved in the passing game and and looking really good as a runner as well so I'm excited about those two players and and with those two names I feel like we've shouted out probably 10 or maybe more running backs on this episode and that is how you know man that we are it's it's a good time to be a fantasy player that needs a running back because we're back yeah, we, that's 20 total players, I believe. Uh, if we forgot any, feel free to let us know yeah. on any of the socials. Uh, I'll, I'll let you do the, the social plug, though. Oh, I, that was good. I, I don't have the doing there. I don't have this, the skill that you have to, to <laughs> roll them off. But just saying, yeah. you know, if you're like, hey, they forgot whoever. I don't even know. But that, that's that's we forgot them, apparently. Yeah. If we forgot them find us and um, i'll tell you that you're wrong <laughs> yeah, no, no, not <laughs> that, that guy, guy stinks not that guy if you want to let us know you can find us at twitter camp underscore dynasty and tiktok at camp dot dynasty also subscribe to our youtube channel you can get in touch with us in all of those places and let us know who we left off 20 players deep we're only a half season in but you know there's players that we forgot about so let us know and uh, also like, rate, review, subscribe, share, follow, and whatever else to the pod feed because we appreciate it. Hey, got another Rogers Hail Mary tonight. Oh, my God. <laughs> We're so back. <laughs> uh, all is balance in the football universe. <laughs> and with that, let's head to the second half of our college football season back next week with more regularly scheduled programming, more badges to be handed out. So thanks for stopping by Camp Dynasty this week, and we'll see you next week.